Okay, today we're going to continue talking about non-allelic homologous recombination as it occurs between repeated sequences in our genome. Our first example will be globins, but we will also see some others. So we've got a lot of repeated sequences in our genome, as we know. These include gene families, where the genes occur in tandem. And we also have to think about transposable elements, such as alu elements and lines, which are scattered throughout our genome. And there are other small gene families, too, where there's one or two copies of a, the same or similar genes. So let's talk about globins briefly. Um, the globins are, are the proteins that make up our hemoglobin. And a hemoglobin tetramer contains two alpha chains and two beta chains, along with a non-protein heme. So we're going to have different examples of the globin proteins that are produced at different times during development. And these occur on two different chromosomes, one on chromosome 16 for the alpha chains, and the beta chains are located on chromosome 11. Okay, both of these clusters also include some pseudogenes, which are called psi. And remember what those are. They're remnants of protein coding genes that are no longer active. Okay, importantly with the globins, they include genes that are expressed at different times during embryonic and fetal development. Okay, so here's a representation of um, the alpha and beta globin clusters. Okay, the alpha has a one embryonic form, which is expressed very early in development, and then three pseudogenes, and then really two mature adult alpha chains, alpha two and alpha one. These are encoded together on, um, as one entity on, on one chromosome, 16. Okay, the beta globin locus is a little more complicated. We have a very early version, the epsilon version, which is made in early embryos. Then we have the fetal form, which is G gamma and A gamma. Those are made in during development until birth. Then we've got a pseudogene. And then we have two mature adult globins, which are switched on about the time of birth. One of those is delta and one is beta. Now beta is the major one. There's very little delta expression, generally speaking. So they are expressed in order of development as they are existing along the um, complete locus. So for the alpha, the zeta is only for expressed for a few weeks, and then the adult alphas are switched on, etc. So this is represented here uh, for the beta locus, where there is an upstream locus control region, and early in embryonic development, it directs expression of the early epsilon form. In fetus, that switches, there's a switch to express the G gamma and A gamma fetal forms. And then around the time of birth, there's yet another switch where the locus control region um, turns on the beta, adult beta form. So this locus control region basically controls the sequence of expression at different times during development. So here's a timing representation where um, on the left we see conception moving on towards birth, etc. So we have, and this is for the beta globins and the alphas, that the early form, the embryonic form, are very early, turning off by six weeks after conception, at which time the alphas are replaced by the um, adult forms, which will remain throughout life. For the betas, we have a switch to the fetal form, and that will occur, um, will, will, those forms will persist during fetal development and is switched off around the time of birth, at which time the adult beta globins are turned on. Okay, so this is not about regulation right now. What we need to talk about is the perils of repeated sequences in our genome. So remember what homologous recombination is. Of course, this is a normal process that occurs in meiosis and can also occur to some extent in mitotic cells. So the point about homologous recombination, it uses the sequence similarity between the two DNA molecules to actually exchange parts of chromosomes, parts of genes with each other. So normally this includes allelic sequences, which is to say DNA sequences that occur at equivalent, equivalent locations on equivalent chromosomes. So those are the ones that will undergo legitimate, real allelic recombination, which is a normal process, which we can certainly suspect. Okay, now sometimes this process goes awry 
in that you do have exchange between sequences which are similar enough in sequence to recombine, but that do not occupy equivalent locations. And that's the major issue we're going to be discussing today. So regular homologous recombination occurs between sequences that occupy equivalent locations on chromosomes from mom and from dad, etc. Non-allelic homologous recombination can also occur, and the recombination does involve exchanges of sequences that are similar to one another, but do not occur at equivalent locations. And this type of recombination can cause disease and other major problems. So here's a depiction of homologous recombination. We've got the orange chromosome and the blue chromosome. And those two chromosomes during meiosis will pair and exchange parts as an essential feature of basically all meioses. And as a result of the breakage and reunion of the chromatids, you end up with recombinants where the, the two original homologs have switched parts of themselves. And this is a normal process to be expected during meiosis. And this emphasizes the fact that it is equivalent information that's being exchanged. You've got your yellow chromosome and your blue chromosome, and the alleles are designated with either uppercase or lowercase letters. And the, during the formation of the crossover, the two chromatids will break and rejoin with each other, switching the allelic arrangements from one homolog to the other, but really with no gain or loss of information. You might switch the lowercase alleles with the uppercase alleles, but those are equivalent gene sequences that you're exchanging. And this is a normal part of every, every meiosis. So non-allelic means that you're going to exchange sequences because of their sequence similarity. And so they're homologous in that sense, but they're not necessarily allelic to each other, which is to say they do not occupy equivalent positions on homologous chromosomes. So we will have repeats in our genomes that can actually have exchange events which can lead to um, abnormal chromosomes and various sorts of illness, diseases of one kind or another. So this is also called illegitimate recombination, and I think I've said this about five times already. Um, they are not actually allelic to each other, although they are sufficiently similar to allow so-called homologous recombination. So we're going to talk about different examples of this because it can occur in, in different situations. Uh, the first two examples will have to do with gene families, like, for example, the globins, where the same gene or a very similar one is repeated, often in tandem. And our, that's going to be our globin example. But there's also the issue of um, repeated elements, such as allo elements, endogenous retroviruses, etc., which are similar to each other in sequence, and can also undergo exchange. And that's, those cause the problems too. So here's our globin locus again. Ignore the fact we're talking about regulation. Um, the point is that these are all very closely related protein coding genes, that they're all beta globins. And even though they're slightly different in amino acid sequence, they're similar enough that they can align with each other and undergo recombination when they're not aligned with their complete actual homolog. So that's represented here. I just drew um, the formation of a famous hemoglobin called Lepore hemoglobin. And this is a result of unequal sister chromatid exchange. Okay, so the two the loci, we're supposed to have G gamma, A gamma, delta, beta. I'm ignoring the epsilon. And the delta and the beta are similar to one another, of course, because they're both beta globins. Now, you can have misalignment of those chromatids in mitosis or meiosis, such that the beta and the delta will line up with each other and undergo recombination, as shown by the X. Okay, so that leads to loss of information from one chromosome and gain of information by the other chromosome, with sometimes bad effects. So I drew this a little picture. Um, the way to draw these chromatid exchanges is start at the left, just work your way along, and when you get to the X, switch to the other chromosome and continue. So we're going to make a blue chromatid and a green chromatid as a result of this misalignment and unequal sister chromatid exchange. So the outcome of that, one chromosome gains information. That ends up with a G gamma, A gamma, delta, a beta delta fusion, and a beta. Now that chromosome is fine because it actually has 
at least one good copy of each of the genes. The other product of the exchange, however, has the G gamma, A gamma, and then a delta beta fusion. And that one's bad news because the delta gene is not expressed very strongly, so that essentially is without a full-fledged beta globin. And that's the Lepore hemoglobin. Okay, here's a picture that came from a book that says basically the same thing, that you've had your exchange between your delta and your beta, with the result that you produce the Lepore hemoglobin, which has just the G gamma, A gamma, and the delta beta fusion, but also the anti-Lepore, where you've got your G gamma, A gamma, delta, beta, delta, and beta. So this is a result of recombination, illegitimate recombination, because beta and delta are not allelic to one another, even though they are adjacent to each other on the same chromosome. And I just drew that again. Follow the chromatid and then see what the results are. So as a result of this rare recombination, this is out in the population, it can be seen, but it's rare enough that homozygotes don't really occur. So it doesn't have any terrible effect on the person, but this is something that does occur, has been seen in nature. Another example of famous example of illegitimate recombination um, caused the formation of the Kenya hemoglobin, but it's the same idea, just a different misalignment. In this case, you have a beta aligning with an A gamma, to which is, of course, very similar, and an exchange, which results in one chromosome that has a G gamma, an A gamma beta fusion, and then the antikinia is the one that gains information. It has G gamma, A gamma, delta, beta, A gamma, delta, beta. So that is a completely, it's an abnormal chromosome, but it doesn't have any deleterious effects. Another example of a globin rearrangement, which results from, again, an illegitimate exchange, is the hemoglobin, of he, the Kenya hemoglobin. Okay, so it's a slightly different recombination event, but the idea is the same. One chromatid gained information, and the other one lost information. Another example of illegitimate exchange is very important in the human population, is exchanges involving the opsin genes because illegitimate recombination here is a major source of color blindness in the human population. So the red and green opsin genes are um, pigments that are normally located in the eye, and the protein, parting, protein coding portions are located in a tandem cluster on the X chromosome. The blue opsin is elsewhere. The red and green mutations are very common. They are red green options are located on the X chromosome as indicated by the yellow arrow. So what this looks like in terms of functionality here, the different options absorb wa different wavelengths of light um, in order that we can distinguish one color from the other. The blue option is located elsewhere and the red and green are the ones that are located in tandem on the X chromosome. And you can see from their absorption spectra that they absorb wavelengths at different from one another, ultimately allowing us to distinguish red from green and other colors. Okay, what the genes look like, and this slide illustrates some very important points about this, a person with a, well, chromos an X chromosome, which can confer normal color vision, includes a locus control region on the left, and at least and one red opsin gene, colored red, and at least one green option gene, colored green. So this arrangement where you've got the locus control region, then red, and then one or more greens is, is typical of normal color vision. Now, interestingly, if you've got an array of green genes, it's actually only the first one in the array that counts. The other ones are sort of extra. So we're gonna have a any particular cone cell will express either the red or the green, interestingly, under the control of the locus control region. The red and green genes are also called L and M for long and wavelength, respectively. And again, the blue is not part of the array. It's located elsewhere. Okay, back to our slide, I'd like to illustrate a few things about the red-green color blindness thing, that some people or some chromosomes will carry only one opsin in this example on C, is just a red one and there's no green. 
So clearly a person that has that as their only option will not be able to distinguish red from green. Interestingly, some of the colorblindness alleles illustrate some important points. If you look at D, there's a stop codon right in the middle of the red protein coding gene. So that's going to lead to an inactive red gene, and the person will have normal green, but they will not be able to distinguish red from green. Okay, that another interesting example here, look at F and G for green color blindness. If we have a stop codon in the middle of a green gene, and it's the first one in the array, that person will have green color blindness. But if we take that same stop codon in G and put it in the second gene in the array, the person has normal color vision because their, their green gene, they, is the, the first one on the array is, is the one that's functional. Okay, some interesting defects occur when we have actual exchanges within the red and green genes so that you have hybrid genes formed, which are part red and part green. So those are anomalous in the sense that the individual is not able to distinguish red and green very well, but the proteins that are produced have slightly different um, absorption properties from the wild type. So I think I just went through all this. The most common type of variant is actually when you have a red-green hybrid gene and that causes the inability to distinguish those two wavelengths. Some of the origin here, we can have recombination between the gene copies or we can have recombination within the tube, within the protein coding regions of a tube. So the top figure shows a red and a green aligned with a red and a green out of register so that the recombination event occurs between the red and the green on one chromatid and after the green on the other. Now the result of that will be one chromatid in which there's just a red, no green, and the uh, reciprocal event will give you a red and two greens. So clearly a person that doesn't have a green gene is going to have defects in distinguishing red and green colors. Okay, the other event that's shown here is where you have an illegitimate recombination between a red and a green to give you a hybrid form. And the result of that would be a red, a green-red fusion, and another green. So that again would cause problems in distinguishing color. I just drew the outlines of how to do these exchanges. Um, basically the same thing, start with a chromatid on the left, move along, go to the X, cross over, and follow it along and see what the outcomes are. And that's how you will do all of these. Okay, ultimately, we've got the spectrum here of what some of these um, pigments will look like, especially the ones that are hybrids between they're not really green and they're not really red. They have absorbance properties that are different from the wild type, again, causing difficulty in distinguishing between those two colors. Finally, here's another representation of the same thing where we have the long wavelength red and the green one. You can have recombination in the intergenic regions between them, or you can have recombination within the two genes to cause the formation of these hybrid forms. It's the same thing as before, it's just represented a little bit differently. So the outcome will be sometimes you get no green gene, but more likely you have these red-green fusion genes, which are neither red nor green, and therefore are not able to help distinguish those colors from one another. And of course, if you're male, you have only one X chromosome. So if you inherit a chromosome with no green or a fusion gene, you're going to have difficulties distinguish, distinguishing red from green. Um, females have much less of an issue because we have two X chromosomes, and so we've got two, two opportunities to get um, one of each functioning properly. So these are all involved in exchanges between sister chromatids or homologous chromosomes. Okay, my last example is the ribosomal DNA repeats. Remember, these are arranged in tandem in very long arrays, and they very often have illegitimate exchanges that change the number of copies in an array. This kind of event occurs all the time, and so these arrays are constantly expanding and contracting. So here's a picture. We've got a ribosomal array, and it's misaligned with its sister chromatin, so that an unequal exchange 
leads to the formation of one chromatid with extra copies and another copy, another uh, um, version of the chromatid with fewer. Okay, following this again, start on the left, go to the right, go to the X, cross over, and see what, ev what the eventual chromatid looks like. So the, as, as before, the outcome is going to be the gain of repeats on one chromatid and loss from the other chromatid. So we've got our alpha globin worksheet, and you're asked to diagram a recombination event that will make a chromosome with three active alpha genes, and also one that makes an alpha-2, alpha-1 fusion. So again, I've shown these misaligned. And here's an example of recombination event. All right, so what I did was I took the blue chromosome, starts out with the pseudo-alpha-2, goes to alpha-2, and then crosses over with alpha-1. The reciprocal event has got the same pseudogene, pseudo-alpha-2, alpha-2. Now we've got an alpha-1, alpha-2 fusion, and an alpha-1. Okay, and the other two chromosomes, I aligned them such that the pseudogene was aligned with alpha-1. Okay, and that one we're going to end up with a blue chromosome, which is in trouble because it's going to have a pseudogene fused to an alpha-1, and that will have no active alpha gene because the pseudogene is inactive. The um, reciprocal event gives you essentially a gain of information on the other chromosome, and it will have a pseudogene alpha-2 and then an alpha-1 pseudogene arrangement, which is also inactive, but it also has alpha-2 and alpha-1. So that lower one will have actually three active alpha genes because it has alpha-2 from the pink chromosome, and then it went um, switched to the alpha-2, alpha-2. The blue chromosome, however, has no active alpha gene. The pair on the top will give you an alpha-1, alpha-2 fusion, as requested. All right, so look at the chromosomes, do the exchange, and then look at what the outcome is in each case. Right? For the top event, each chromosome has at least one active alpha gene, but it does have the alpha-1, alpha-2 fusion. But on the bottom exchange, you're going to produce a chromosome that has no active alpha gene. So that's going to produce an inactive protein. So what you do is align them in whatever way you can, and then do the crossover and see what the products are. Okay. So many events are caused by transposon recombination, which you can imagine because we've got these things scattered all over our genome. So the potential for recombination between them seems enormous. It's kind of amazing that it doesn't occur as frequently, or it doesn't occur more frequently than it does. So we're going to do one example today involving exchange between two elements, and this is going to be by unequal sister chromatid exchange. Okay, so there's other forms of exchange which we'll talk about next time, so we're just going to stick with the sister chromatid version right now. So this has to do with recombination between two alu elements that are within the lysyl hydroxylase gene. So these two elements are sitting at introns, and that recombination between the two of them will have difficult or bad effects on the gene lysyl hydroxylase. So this is what the wild type situation looks like. You have exons 1 through 9, there's an alu in intron 9, and then you've got another 10 through 16, and then there's another alu before the seventh exon. So what we're going to try to do is a sister chromatid exchange involving those alus that's going to lead to the duplication of exons 10 through 16. So we have to align our alus in such a way that recombination between them will lead to this requ requested duplication. Now, it will also lead to a deletion of exons from the reciprocal event, of course. So all I did was I typed out 1 through 5, etc. So what we're going to do is a recombination between the alu that's in the ninth in the intron between exons 9 and 10, and then on its sister chromatid, the alu that's between um, exons 16 and 17. So follow the chromatids again, and one version will have exons 1 through 9, then the fused alu, and then 17. So that product is a deletion. It's going to be missing exons 10 through 16. The reciprocal product is what we're looking for, and that one will have exons 1 through 9, then alu, then 10 through 16, then it crosses over in the alu, and then you've got another 10 through 16, and then alu 17. 
So again, the uh, reciprocal event leads to two abnormal chromosomes, one with a deletion and the other with a duplication. But the one we're at being asked for is a duplication of exons 10 through 16. So that's the answer to the handout.